Gingival and periodontal diseases in children. Gingival, it is a part of the oral mucous membrane. The oral mucous membrane covers the oral cavity and separates it from the vital structures of the oral cavity. The oral mucous membrane can either be keratinized or non-keratinized. Gingiva, it is a part of keratinized oral mucous membrane. So gingiva can be defined as the part of oral mucosa which covers the alveolar process of the jaws and surrounds the neck of the teeth from the periphery. It is one of the most important part of the periodontium. Periodontium further supports the teeth. So gingiva plays an important role in supportive function of the teeth and in nutritive function of the teeth. It also helps in proprioception, that is, perceiving impulses from the exterior and taking it to the interior or the vital organs. Now, what is the periodontium? The periodontium consists or it comprises of the supporting structures of the teeth. It mainly consists of the gingiva, the periodontal ligament, the cementum and the alveolar bone. The prevalence of gingival diseases in children has been reported to be by 99% according to the epidemiological studies. Even the prevalence of periodontal diseases in children in, is more. But as compared to adults, the incidence and the prevalence of periodontal diseases in children is less. This is because of the slower rate of destruction of the periodontal ligament and the faster rate of production of the periodontal ligament fibers. This will lead to the slower rate of resorption of the alveolar bone and the periodontal ligament fibers. So, as, a, as we all know that gingiva is a part of oral mucous membrane, it comprises of mainly three parts, that is the papillary gingiva, the marginal gingiva, and the interdental gingiva. It also comprises of the attached gingiva as well. Now it has come to know that what is the papillary gingiva. Papillary gingiva is a part of the gingiva which houses the interdental spaces between the teeth. It is also known as gingival papilla. Now what is the marginal gingiva? The marginal gingiva it circumscribes the crevices of the teeth and margins around the teeth cervical region. The attached gingiva is continuous with the marginal gingiva. So the attached gingiva comprises of certain special features. These are known as interdental clefts. Interdental clefts are present mainly in children. It is present in the saddle areas of the gingiva. Now let us know what is the main difference between Gingiva of adult and gingiva of a child. There are many hallmark differences between the two. First of all, in children, the gingiva is bright red in color, whereas in adults, it is coral red in color or coral pink in color. That means this is because of the increased vascularity of the gingiva in children, decreased keratinization and decreased number of the epithelial layer that is the stratified squamous epithelial layer which covers the gingiva it has fewer number of layers lesser keratinization and higher vascular supply leading to the bright red color of gingiva in children similarly the texture of gingiva in children is less stippled now what are stipplings stipplings are the depressions and the protuberances which are present on the surface of the gingiva. These are formed due to the indentations of the connective tissue in the epithelium. The main function of stippling is reinforcement of the gingiva. Thus, in children, the gingiva is less stippled, that is the protuberances of the connective tissue in the epithelium are lesser in number. Stippling are responsible for a healthy gingiva. The incidence or the density of stippling is more in adults than in children. Now coming over 
to the consistency of gingiva. In children, the consistency of gingiva is more flaccid or loose. This is because of the connective tissue fibers which are present in the gingiva are lesser in number, they are lessly interconnected and they are immature in nature. The circular fibers of the gingiva that is A fiber and B fiber are less mature. Similarly, the ratio of the connective tissue and the ground substance is lesser in children than that of the adult gingiva. So the gingiva of adult is more firmer than that of a child. Now, the margin of gingiva in children is thick collar like. This is because of the spacing between the teeth and the saddle areas of the gingiva. This will give rise to the collar like appearance or the rounded protuberances in between the gingiva of a child. Whereas the margin of gingiva is knife edged shape or is very fine and thin in the case of adult gingiva. It is also less keratinized and more prone to infections and inflammation. Similarly, coming over to the interdental area. The interdental area means the margin or the area of the gingiva which connects the buccal side of the gingiva to the lingual side of the gingiva. In children, it is skeletonized or saddle type or saddle in shape. That means the degree of keratinization of the interdental gingiva in children is greater, it is more. Whereas in adults, this gingiva is cold shaped or tent shaped. It is also known as tentorium. So due to its lesser keratinization, the interdental gingiva in adults is more prone to infection and inflammation. These were the peculiar characteristic features between of differences the adult gingiva and the child gingiva. Similarly, the parental ligament fibers as I have already told are lesser dense and less mature than that of the adult gingiva. Retrocuspid papilla and interdental clefts are the peculiar features of attached gingiva in children. But in adults, this peculiar feature is absent. Now, what is retrocuspid papilla? It is peculiarly a depression which is present 1 millimeter below the canine area or the marginal groove beneath the gingiva of the canine on the lingual side. This is basically present in 85% of children. Then, the gingiva of a child is less susceptible to infections because the rate of formation of the fibers is more than that of the rate of destruction. It is more keratinized, have saddle interdental areas also. The alveolar bone of a child is more spongy and less dense than that of an adult. Now coming over to the gingival diseases, the disease or the inflammation of gingiva is known as gingivitis. It is the inflammation of gingiva without any loss of attachment of the junctional epithelium. Whereas in periodontitis, there's a loss of the junctional epithelium and loss of attachment. The classification of gingival diseases can be either classified into the dental plaque induced diseases and the non plaque induced diseases. The plaque induced diseases are further classified into those which are associated with dental plaque those which are associated with systemic factors, those which are associated with medications like administration of valproic acid, sodium valproate and phenytoin leads to gingival enlargement or those who are modified by malnutrition, for example, quashircle or marasmus. Now, coming over to the non-plaque induced gingival diseases, they are basically either of bacterial origin and viral origin fungal origin or due to underlying systemic conditions like leukemia or lymphoma, then due to trauma or traumatic lesions 
or due to foreign body reactions which are generally non-specified or idiopathic. For example, any allergy to the pollens. Now, gingivitis has been reported to be around 99% in children. The gingivitis can be classified into either initial, early, moderate, mild and late phases according to the degree of the increased gingival inflammation. Now, the acute gingival diseases in children can either be classified into the acute bacterial gingivitis, then acute herpetostomatitis or herpes simplex virus infections, then acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, acute candidiasis, then acute gingival abscess and eruption gingivitis. Now, let us see what is eruption gingivitis. It is a phase of gingiva inflammation in children between 6 to 36 months of age during the eruption of the teeth. It is a transient phase that means it will subside on its own. It is basically due to the localized infection and inflammation due to accumulated food debris and poor oral hygiene measures. Now, the treatment for the same can be irrigation by peroxide or any topical anesthetic agent. Then, maintenance of oral hygiene measures can also help in the treatment of the same. Generally, we can see that bluish discoloration of the gingiva can be found around the erupting tooth. It can also be erythematous in nature. Now, what is acute inflammatory enlargement of the gingiva? I've seen many cases of such in my clinic wherein the patient is reported after biting of the heat, the hard object, the patient get pain in the gingiva and swelling in the gingiva. So, acute inflammatory enlargement of the gingiva is basically a localized and a painful enlargement of the gingiva. When the patient comes, he reports of immediate enlargement after taking of any hard food. For example, biting of an apple or a piece of a meat or even sometimes after hard brushing or vigorous brushing. It has sudden onset and generally it is limited to the marginal and the interdental gingiva. We can see that the area which is adjacent to the infected place will also be tender to percussion or sensitive to touching. It is a very painful situation. The treatment can be done by localizing the fluctuant area and inciding in the, with the BP plate. Further, by irrigating the same after 24 hours with warm water saline and covering it with a gauze pad. Now coming over to acute candidiasis, it can also be known as moniliasis, candidiasis or oral thrush. This is generally seen in very young children. The main causative organism is candida albicans. It can be localized by brushing the area or the affected area if it gets stripped out easily, it means that the area is affected by candidiasis. It can be seen as raised white furry patches on the oral mucosa or the gingiva. And on removing the white furry areas, they can reveal red bleeding points. This is also known as neonatal candidiasis. The treatment can be done by antifungal medications like clotrimazole, nystatin, generally 1 ml of oral drop of nystatin is given 4 times daily to a neonate. Now coming over to the herpes simplex virus infection, which is one of the most prevalent viral infection in children as well as adults. Most of the, most of the people, like 85% of the people are carriers of the herpes simplex virus. The herpes simplex virus 1 causes infection in the upper body and type 2 causes infection in the lower body. The primary infection generally 
hits the children who are 6 years of age and have no initial contact with the same virus. It can be reported as the prodromal symptoms or the symptoms which appear before the occurring of the disease that is mild itching, burning or tingling sensation of the affected area and the patient will be very irritable. It is generally preceded by the tension stage or the fever or any stage of aggression. It can also manifest symptoms such as cold sores, the blisters, fever, herpes labialis or infectious mononucleosis. The oral manifestations include diffuse erythematous or fiery red tissue of the oral mucosa. It can also manifest as gingival bleeding and small ulcerations on the gingiva. In this infection, the blisters are generally small, round and discreet. They are spherical in shape and on rupturing, they give rise to the erythematous ulcer which is surrounded by a bright erythematous area. Now these ulcers, they generally secrete a yellowish fluid which is leading to cross-contamination. So such patients of herpes simplex virus should be generally isolated from the rest of the people. They require adequate of oral hydration and proper bed rest. The palliative treatment for the same or the symptomatic treatment it is extended from 10 to 14 days with complete bed rest, isolation to prevent any cross-contamination and adequate food intake a nutritional supply should also be maintained in such patients. The definitive therapy involves antiviral drugs since this disease is due to the herpes simplex virus. So antiviral drugs like acyclovir that is 5 equal doses of generally 1000 mg per day should be continued for 10 days. And famcyclovir and valcyclovir are the other medications which are used. Even antihistaminic drug therapy is encouraged in the definitive treatment of the same. So if there is a primary attack of herpes simplex virus, the virus will house itself in the neurons or the ganglia innocuously. And if a phase of stress or some long-standing fever or disease exists, then this virus becomes active and it may appear as fever blisters or cold sores or herpes labialis in the subject. Generally, it exists from or the symptoms are there from about 5 to 7 days and the treatment should be continued in the same. The course of treatment comprises of valcyclovir should be given 4 grams. Initially, the dose will be 2 grams and later on it will be elevated to 4 grams followed by 2 grams of penicyclovir or acyclovir after 12 hours. Now coming over to the acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. It is the microbial disease of the gingiva which is generally due to spirochetes or bacteria. It may be due to the impaired host immunity, the cellular or the humoral immunity and the impaired host immune response. It is generally characterized by slouthing of the gingiva tissues, that is, the gingiva becomes denuded. The bacteria which are responsible or the organisms which are responsible for the same are the spirochetes, the bacteroids, the privotella intermedia, the palladium, triponoma palladium, and triponoma denticola. Now, what are the characteristic features? of acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis lesions. The lesions are generally punched out or crater-like. Generally, the interdental gingiva is affected. The, the gingiva may become bright red erythematous leading to bleeding and pain in the same. There are certain stages of the disease. In stage 1, 
the marginal gingiva or the tip of the interdental papilla is involved. Later on, the ulcer slowly spreads throughout the interdental papilla. Then it spreads in stage 3 to the marginal gingiva or the gingival margin. Stage 4, the whole marginal gingiva is covered and progressing to the attached gingiva. In stage 5, the necrosis extends up to the buccal or the labial mucosa. And finally, in stage 6, the alveolar bone is resolved. And the last or the final stage, in stage 7, the skin of the cheek is perforated. These are the various stages of progression of the acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis can be so severe. Now there are certain primary and secondary features of the same. The primary features or the diagnosing features involve gingival bleeding, pain, the interdental ulcerations and as we all know that the ulcerations are deep crater like. There is a necrosis of the papilla, the temperature is elevated with a moderate trade of fever and there is the blunting or the cratering of the gingiva and the gingival margin becomes blunt. The secondary features include the pseudomembrane and the grayish whitish slough may cover the ulcers with a very poor odor from the mouth and the wooden sensation of the teeth. The treatment of the same can either be local, systemic, supportive or etiotractic. The local symptoms or the local treatment involve treating of all the symptoms. It involves adequate bed rest, then copious fluid intake and re removal of any pain by analgesics. The first stage in the local treatment involves removal of the necrotic slough or irrigation of the slough and removal of any bacteria or any debris which are clinging to the lesion. The irrigation should be done with a warm saline and the debris should be removed with a cotton swab which is soaked in hydrogen peroxide. Then supragingival scaling is done. Then after two days the same lesion is treated with subgingival scaling with the advice of continuing of the hydrogen peroxide mouthwashes twice daily with chlorhexidine mouthwash four times daily. Further, in the third visit, the chlorhexidine mouthwash is asked to be continued with the discontinuation of the hydrogen peroxide mouthwash. Even subgingival scaling is done in the same stage. Now coming over to the periodontal diseases in children. Now what is periodontitis? As I have already told you, it is the loss of attachment or basically pocket formation and destruction of the supportive tissues of the alveolar bone and the teeth. The periodontium mainly comprises of the gingiva, the alveolar bone, the cementum. The classification of periodontal diseases can be divided into prepubertal diseases or aggressive periodontitis. The prepubertal disease can be further classified into localized or generalized periodontitis and the aggressive can also be divided into localized and generalized aggressive periodontitis. Further, the periodontitis can be ex the associated with systemic diseases such as Down syndrome, hypophosphatasia, leukocyte addition deficiency, papillon Levre syndrome and chediac higashi syndrome. We will be considering a few of the same. Now coming over to aggressive periodontitis. Aggressive periodontitis is also known as juvenile periodontitis. It is the name which is given to a number or a group of periodontal diseases which generally occur in very young children who are generally healthy or do not have any diseased condition. They are more present in blacks than in whites or Hispanics. It generally involves adult and school-going children. 
Now, what is the main etiology or the cause of the disease? It may either due to hereditary or genetic reasons. Then it can also be due to the leukocyte adhesion deficiency. That is the leukocytes or the polymorphous neutrophils which adhere to the antigen or any foreign body if they have defective phagocytotic activity or adhesion property or migration property it will lead to the same disease the microbiology involved the actinomycetes actinomycetocomitins porphyromonas gingivalis bacteriomelanogenica Privotella intermedia and the capnocytophagia. It also involves bacteriocytes as well. Generally, very young children, gen less than four years, are affected with the incidence more in females than that of males. These the teeth which are affected are according to the chronology or the eruption sequence, that is, the incisors and the molars are involved. They'll become loose, they'll migrate, and they'll exfoliate later on. So all the primary teeth are affected, but not exceeding than 14 in number. If 14 number of teeth are involved, it will belong to generalized aggressive periodontitis. The main striking feature or the hallmark feature of the disease is that is there is any absence of inflammation or Plaque and calculus are not at all present around the teeth. The teeth or the incisors and the molars will become loose, they will become motile and with the flaring of the incisors that is distal labial migration of the maxillary incisors. This will further lead to diastema formation. The radiological features involve arc-shaped bone loss around the teeth from the distal area of the premolar to the mesial surface of the molar. Generally, this archetype of bone loss is bilateral or mirror-like of images are seen in the radiograph. The treatment can be by doxycycline 250mg 4 times daily for 1 week, even subgingival irrigation and irrigation with hydrogen peroxide can help a lot. Coming over to the prepubertal periodontitis, it also affects children less than 4 years. It can either be classified into localized or generalized type of periodontitis. The main organisms involved are Actinomyces, Porphyromonas gingivalis, and Fusobacterium nucleatum. The main difference between aggressive periodontitis and this childhood periodontitis is that Acute symptoms of inflammation are present in this disease with slight accumulation of plaque and calculus. There is an extremely rapid destruction of the alveolar bone on the gingiva with abnormal probing depth. Even respiratory tract infections and otitis media can be found in this type of diseases. In this disease, all the primary teeth are involved, whereas in aggressive periodontitis, only incisors and molars are involved, and not more than 14 teeth could be involved. Here, the patient can turn edentulous because of the exfoliation of all the teeth. Gingival clefts, recession, tooth mobility, and then rapid alveolar bone loss can be found with premature exfoliation of the teeth. The perfect teeth appear as normal but also exfoliate around about 14 years of age so they require proper uh, the complete denture is required by the patient so what is the difference between generalized periodontitis which is prepubertal and the localized prepubertal periodontitis in generalized periodontitis severe inflammation is seen whereas in localized type lesser amount of inflammation is seen. There is a generalized involvement of teeth or all the teeth are involved. Only a few teeth are involved in localized periodontitis. There is a more rapid destruction of bone in generalized type of periodontitis with the functional effect in neutrophils and monocytes in both.
This is generally not amenable to any antibiotic therapy rather than that of localized type of pedontitis. Now there are certain systemic disorders which are associated with the pedontal diseases. They can be either leukemia, papillonephrosis syndrome, cyclic neutropenia and hypophosphatemia. Histocytosis X and other type of diseases are also associated with the pedontal ligament. Now what is leukemia? Leukemia is generally a neoplastic disorder with the abnormal maturation of the leukocytes that is the leukocytes which are present in the plasma or the blood are immature and larger in size and shape. Generally, the infiltration of the leukocytes in the gingiva and the oral tissues with giving the oral manifestations of gingival enlargement leading to ulceration, the destruction of the pedontal ligament, destruction of the alveolar bone and the attached gingiva and finally thinning of the lamina dura. This will lead to the exfoliation and the migration of teeth. The basic characteristic feature of gingiva in the leukemic patient is the interdental gingiva or the marginal gingiva is involved. The gingiva generally covers the entire teeth and this will lead to the accumulation of plaque calculus and debris between the teeth. Gingiva is firm, shiny and erythematous in appearance. Sometimes it can also give a bluish tinge. The surface is shiny as I have already told and tumor like masses of the interdentival gingiva are found due to inflammation of the same. The knife edge type of margin of gingiva is totally lost and is replaced by rounded protuberances and rounded margins of the gingiva. So we can see all this inflammation will finally lead to ulcerations in the gingiva, then denuded surfaces, more bleeding and inflammation. After removing of the irritating factors, the plaque, complete oral scaling can lead to relieving of the symptoms. Now, papillon nephris syndrome. It is generally a group of symptoms like the hyperkeratosis of palms and soles, intracranial calcifications which are not generally found but they may be found in few patients. Then the precautious periodontitis in other patients also. It is generally linked to autosomal recessive disorder and is linked to the Q chromosome. Other responsible mechanisms or other responsible bacteria are the capnocytophagia, echinella and the fusobacterium. So if a patient reports to a clinic with highly keratinized palms and sores with creasing of the palms and sores and if there is custing of the same and if we see the intracranial radiograph we can see the calcifications of the same. The periodontal features or the intraoral manifestations will be severe destruction of the periodontium and bone loss finally with the loss of primary teeth from 1 to 5 years of age and by 15 years the complete dentition will be lost. Even permanent dentition is lost but it can also erupt normally in some cases. Radiographically there will be severe horizontal bone loss. The treatment can be by using tetracyclines, retinoids for healing of the skin lesion, then subgingival debridement by scaling and root planing, then identification of the specific pathogens which are responsible for the disease and treating the same by antibiotics, full mouth extraction and replacement by the complete denture. Now, hypophosphatasia, which is another disease which is linked to the periodontium, is due to decrease amount of the serum alkaline phosphate and the reciprocal increase in the phosphoenolpyruvate in the 
urine. The oral manifestations include premature mobility and increased bone loss, destruction of the parenchym, and finally the migration and loss of primary teeth. Incisors are affected more than that of molars. The treatment can be either plasma replacement by the normal plasma and using of oral vitamin supplements, phosphate supplements, increased scaling and root planing and the replacement of oral hygiene measures in the patient. Finally, I would like to conclude by saying that American Academy of Pediatric Reco Dentistry recommended the early prevention diagnosis and treatment of the periodontal diseases and establishing of excellent oral hygiene measures in children which will carry over to adulthood for decreasing the risk of periodontal diseases. Thank you.